let it be clear. If you were born in 1995 onward, you have only known a world that has exoplanets. So I will knight you that generation, Generation X exoplanet. <laughs> wow, look at that. I see what you see what I did. You see what I did there? <laughs> right. And by the way, I'm going to say if you were born from 1995 on, you don't know anything. <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> you're, you're a bunch of, like, idiots, Chuck. okay? And social media sucks, <laughs> all right? Your generation is a waste. Vladimir Brutswa wants to know this. Being the exoplanets are out of reach for at least many millennia, why is it important to investigate them? Shouldn't we focus on knowing more about our solar system? You never know how soon somebody's gonna invent a warp drive. It could happen next year, not likely. <laughs> next century, you wanna, you, it's cheap to find planets. You're saying, let's focus on our own planet and on exoplanets, it's telescope time. That's cheap. That's cheap. Exploring the solar system is expensive because you got actual space probes. In. And even that is not as expensive as so many other things that we do in life. Do you realize going to Saturn with Cassini costs less than what Americans spend on lip balm in a year? That yearly budget for that mission? Don't be telling me, let's do this, not that. Let's do it all. Do you think we'll find life on an exoplanet in the next hundred years, Neil? Well, I think yes, because there's a whole cottage sub-industry of exoplanet research that worries about biomarkers. These are things, no, you don't see the life directly on the planetary surface, but you see their effect on the atmosphere of the planet. And, and you can't hide that. So I think we will know one way or another whether a catalog of exoplanets, uh, can, where, whether any of them contain life. Any of them looking at us, they would see sort of runaway smog and greenhouse gases, and they, they, they would tell them there's no sign of intelligent life on Earth. We're seeing the effect a planet has on its star as the planet moves in front or transits its star. So we're, we're seeing the planet move, but only by measuring how the starlight changes, okay? We're not seeing the planet directly. So how much can you tell from a dip in light that's coming from a star? I mean, it seems like a very limited amount of information. First of all, from the dip, the depth of the transit, you can tell how big the planet is. That's pretty obvious. Like if it's very deep, then the planet is big compared to the star. And if it's shallow, then it's tiny. You can also measure the period. You see how frequently you see these transits in front of the star and you can tell the orbital period of the planet. So these are easy. Now, the other things that are sort of less trivial, but you can also tell how far the transit is off from the center line of the star. Does the planet go exactly along the line of sight, crossing the star along its diameter, or it's like slightly offset, or maybe it's even grazing. So you can tell this from the shape of the transit. I think that's sort of a, oh, wow. an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And I left out the most, maybe most important one, um, which is measuring the atmosphere of the planet and the elements or molecules in the atmosphere. So what you can do is you take a spectrum of the star when the planet is not in front of it. So you take a spectrum, you see the starlight split into wavelengths, and from it's a very complicated spectrum. And from that, you can figure out what elements there are in the spectrum of that star. And then you take another one when the planet is blocking the star, and the starlight is actually shining through the atmosphere of the planet. And the planet's atmosphere will be absorbing some of the starlight. If you compare the two, the spectrum of the star without the planet in front, with the planet in front, you can tell what the atmosphere of the planet is made of. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, you can tell, okay, there is an atmosphere here which has water molecules in it or it has sodium in it. This has or, been or if it has oxygen, that'd be kind of interesting because oxygen is not stable. And so something would be making that oxygen. And then yep, yep. Be, these are, this would be your first indication, or at least your first hint of life, I guess. Yeah, so that's why I mentioned it because exactly the, the, the best bet right now for a, what we call a biomarker is ozone and oxygen. Because if there's no life replenishing these, 
they would basically oxidize the planet. Right, so the right. planet would become big, red, and rusty instead of what it is. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in, in this case, in Earth's case, it's the plant life that's making the oxygen, uh, not humans or any other animal life. So Plus, you know, in the first two billion years, we were not producing oxygen. We were producing methane. So this is not saying that if you see a planet with no oxygen, it has no life. We can't say that yet. Right, but, um, right. Exactly. It is one of one of our best. If it does have oxygen, that's a good bet. If you're that betting is a good person. bet, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I think the question also is what we cannot discover from this. Um, and um, I mean, the, the transit is such that obviously what's on the on the dark side of the planet facing towards us, um, we don't see any details. We can't resolve the planet. A, a transit will not resolve spatial features on this planet. There you go. Um, Whereas a direct imaging of one, the hope is one day we'll have enough resolution to actually see oceans or clouds yeah. or something on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All of the detection techniques we have so far, and now even the characterization techniques, um, they're unable to resolve the surfaces of planets. We don't even see them as a circle. It's just a point of light. In the best case scenario, you collect that light, maybe spread it out into a rainbow and you look for all of these chemical fingerprints that are in the light. Um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't thought about what such a future looks like. Um, what technology would enable resolving the surfaces of planets and what we've come up with so far, maybe the future will hold surprises, but so far we're thinking about a, a network of what's called interferometers in space, well separated out kind of like the ALMA array of uh, submillimeter telescopes in the desert. They work in concert. They combine their light, make use of the fact that you can spread them out over great distances, which gives you very sharp spatial resolution. So maybe that's something that we'll do in the future. What's behind that is, of course, the bigger the telescope, the more resolution you have. So if you have multiple telescopes scattered across the landscape, they have an effective size that is the distance between them, right? It's not just one single lens. And so that's, that's what Natalie's talking about there. And so, yeah, I, I look forward to that. Hey, if you enjoy stupid people as much as I do, and by that I mean laughing at them, then you need to pick up tickets to the taping of my comedy special, Chuck Nice, Just Smart Enough. It's happening November 17th and 18th at the Midnight Theater in Hudson Yards, New York City. Tickets are available at chucknicecomic.com. Go get yours right now. And listen, I'm only joking about the stupid people thing. I mean, there's really no stupid people. There's just misinformed people, right? Will there ever be a way to detect exoplanets quickly without the need for long periods of observation? In other words, will there be a, uh, will there be a, uh, kind of like quick and easy snap to it, like, hey, another exoplanet, there we yeah, go. Yeah, well, they, they might put Jason out of a job. Jason, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, normally we have to wait for it to go all the way around the star. So whatever the planet's orbital period is, you want to have two or three of those. And so if it's a star, if it's a planet like the Earth, that's going to take something like three years. But the other way is if you have a really, really good camera, something that can, uh, so, so it, just take a picture of the planet. And then it's just point and click. You point, you take a picture of the star. Oh, look, the dot there, that's the planet. And if you have the right kind of camera, it can tell you right away if it's the planet or not. Now, so that's the dream. It's called coronography. And uh, there are chronographs that exist, and, and they look for a long time. But if they look at the right star, in a matter of minutes, they know that they've found something that looks like a planet right next to it. So, yeah, hopefully we'll at some point get some space-based coronographic telescopes that can just point and click and find them pretty quickly. Um, yeah, that, 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 that sounds like speaking, it'll take a while. That, that sounds like Tom Hanks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 what was it, the right stuff, whatever. Uh, Tom Hanks puts his thumb up and blocks the moon. Blocks the right? moon, right. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, that's sort of what you're doing. You're, you're trying to block the light from the star because that's drowning out the light from the planet, right? Uh, that's right. And you just want to hold a nickel in front, of, <laughs> in, in front right. of the star and see if you can see the planet kind of thing. And it's a really hard problem. People talk about trying to you know, find a firefly next to a searchlight in New York, but you're doing it from Los Angeles or something. I mean, it's a very difficult technical problem, and that's why, that's why we don't do it all the time right now. 
Okay. Th- yeah, amazing. guess what? Are you thinking about life on the planet you're, you're looking for? Yeah. Planet? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, and um, I think the first uh, sort of written record of someone contemplating about it is is from ancient Greece, but there's also Hyhans in the um, 18th century um, pondering about all the stars being suns and why not they have, they have planets and why some planets actually are like the Earth. And he actually writes in his, there's a very Cosmo Theoros, where he writes like, and there must be all these alien civilizations on these planets, and some of them might be intelligent and looking back at us. I think he published his book sort of to say posthumous, just to make sure he's not burnt on some uh, uh, stake yeah. or something. Um, but Speculating I, I think, about life in the universe, yeah. Yeah. yeah if, if, if the universe is divine because God created it, and we are the divine creation of God, you would not expect to find life anywhere else but Earth. Yeah. So this is quite yeah. heretical, yeah. Now we know that there are, I would the estimates vary over time because we're refining it, but there's basically about 20% of solar type stars have a planet that's rocky. So it's not like a helium or hydrogen giant that's rocky like the earth and is in what we call the habitable zone. So if you multiply the 400 billion stars in our galaxy, you take there's about 40 billion of them similar to the sun. And then you multiply that by 0.2, that's about 8 billion um, rocky habitable planets just in our own galaxy. I think yeah. it's an interesting thing if you look up at the Milky Way, which is lost for 99% of Americans, but if you actually happen to go to one of the national parks or travel far, you look up at the Milky Way, what's the probability of someone looking back at you? I think that's a fun <laughs> question which we don't know the answer to yet. Mm-hmm. That's a little creepy though, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, but Gaspar, we left out a part of that question, which was what percent might be orbiting a, a binary star? Oh, I see. Yes, that was indeed um, part of the question. So um, first of all, just to give a tiny introduction, we actually did not know that there are stable planets around binary stars. So meaning there's a two stars orbiting each other very close in, and there's a planet far out orbiting this binary star. It was only in Star Wars. Tatooine is the only one. But then yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Kepler Space Telescope discovered 16 of them or something like that. So now wow. we know they exist, and we also know that some might be in what we call the habitable zone. So the probability is, is also exists, but these planets are much less frequent than the ones we that around normal stars. So Right, so um, I guess the, the point there that you imply is that if that planet were orbiting closer to the binary star, the orbit would become less stable because it would get yeah. really close to one star and then far from the both. But if you're far enough away... It just sees kind of one average gravity field. Is that a yep. fair way to describe it? That's a fair way of describing it. And if it's very far away, it feels one gravity field, but it does not feel heat anymore. So oh, you get freezing. Okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. you want to be in, in, in the right place. Um, so for a binary star, that's somewhat more limited. And I don't have an, an exact number. I don't think anyone does, but we are closing in on that number by... First of all, knowing the frequency of planets around binary stars or getting a handle on it. And and in the future, I think we will soon learn about what fraction of them are in this habitable zone. What we... and, and I'll just add that most of the stars you see in the night sky are multiple planet, double and multiple planet systems. So so it's the, it's not a, a question about a rare possibility, right? It's It's... Um, mo- binary star systems are not rare in the night sky. So it's a very natural question to wonder whether they could also be repositories of uh, yeah, yeah. planets. About yeah. 70% of stars are in binaries indeed. And I have to add that there's another solution when the two stars are very far from each other, orbiting in, say, thousands of years or tens of thousands of years, and both of them host planets very close in. That's, a oh, different that's, that's the opposite of the other one, right? A yeah. planet orbiting far from the pair and a yeah. pair is or- orbiting far from each other. So they carry their own solar systems around themselves. An unstable planet can either fall into the host star or get kicked out. So that the, the orbit does not maintain itself around the host star. Yeah, planets. yeah. Those are the two solutions. And curiously, we see the effect of both. Um, the planets that fell in the star, they pollute the star. So you can detect elements due to, oh. due to planets oh. that fell in, in the atmosphere of oh. stars. And the planets that were kicked out, that's really amazing, I think, but they were detected through what we call microlensing. They are dark, 
you don't see them, but they go in front of, roughly in front of a star, and they lens the light of the star due to their gravity. And then you see the background star brightening up. And with this thing over a decade or two, they actually measure that there are roughly about 40 billion free floating planets in our galaxy, like one tenth the number of the stars. Of vagabond planets. Yeah, they have no stars. Wow. So if you know you're a, some weird civilization that somehow developed on such a planet because they have, say, radioactive heat coming from the planet, they would actually have a very different view of the universe. Like they don't have a central star. Right. They will, at one point, might discover there are even planets orbiting stars. Right.